Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. Wow, what a, what a first half, huh? We, uh, we've had a chance to hear from Wendell, and uh, Wendell took us back to like the beginning of the contacts, uh, gave us first person stuff about the reality of, of this going on. A lot of behind the scenes, nuts and bolts, verifications of things. And then we moved into Michael, and, and Michael came in and, and summarized the content the content of the messages and, and the importance and why we need to pay attention to the stuff that is coming to us through Billy Meyer from the Pleiadian and other extraterrestrial contact. And now, now we've brought Christian Fenner all the way from Switzerland to continue and build on this. And Christian, you know, kind of for like the last 15 years has been in the Meyer camp and has been living it and has been present through the new series of contacts. And I'm telling you guys, again, we're going to hear first person from a man that has been there and has lived it. And then following Christian's presentation, we will go into Q&A. And then if there's a little time left over, Wendell said that he might be willing to show us a few of the old original type uh, photos from the Meyer case um, at the end, if we have time. OK, ladies and gentlemen. Christian Fenner. Uh, good evening. It's a pleasure for me to be here. Everything is dark here. I'm in the light. I need some paper here for uh, my, my job that I have to fulfill here. First, I have to start here. Um, I need the pictures. Uh, I've ne never been so far away from home, I must admit. And uh, I never held a lecture in this kind of setting. And I'm not English speaking, and I won't talk as fast as Michael. <laughs> uh, OK. Here you see. The shield that's in the, at the entrance of the Simiasi Silver Star Center. And you here see, you see the name Figu. Figu, that's, uh, uh, you see snow. This picture I made a week ago, last weekend. We still have snow since three months. Uh, what I can say is that uh, I am a member of the core group since uh, 1987. That's the, the translation, what FIGO means in English. FIGO was founded by Billy Meyer in 1975. And we core group members are helping him to uh, disseminate the information that's hidden behind this famous UFO case. And here you see uh, where the center lies. You see the mouse here, yeah, OK. Uh, it's not everything here. That's, uh, here is the center. That's Schmidruti here. And this is a, a valley that there's a rim going around here. And I was, this I, I made last weekend also. And here you see the opposite direction. I have stood here on this hill here and made the other photo. Here you see the main building of the center, here the garage. Here is the parking lot, and the other building is uh, to the left side here. So you have uh, some kind of impression. It's uh, uh, not in the center or in a, in a town or in a, in a village. We are about 800 meters above sea level. Yeah. I'm here as a representative of Billy Meyer. Actually, it was he who was invited to come here, um, but he, cannot, he could not come. And he asked me to present you his kind regards to everybody of you, and he wishes you all the best. He could not uh, come to this invitation or follow this in invitation, because since many years, he doesn't leave his, the region where he lives. And although he frequently visits the nearby towns 
where he does shopping for the center or for Figo. He does not travel great distances anymore. And he hasn't left Switzerland for years, but there are exceptions, of course, when he's invited for a flight with the extraterrestrials by his friends. Uh, then the distances are a bit um, farther than uh, just Switzerland, or as it has happened occasionally, or does it happen occasionally, that he asks his friends to go on a trip. And I will uh, talk about two of those that happened uh, Recently, it, the picture should be here. Uh, uh, that's a laptop computer and somehow, ah, good. That's a, a photo of Mars. Billy had uh, wanted to go once again on this red-brown planet on Mars to experience one of those beautiful sunrises with that marvelous blue radiation, which is quite different from the ones here on Earth. It's uh, different when the sun rises there than here on Earth. And second, he wanted to go on the same occasion. He wanted to visit the um, volcano that's called Olympus Mons. That's on Mars, and it's uh, 20. 27,000 meters high, this volcano that's about three times Mount Everest. And he wanted to have a walk on top of it, of course, with a space suit. And the third wish, however, that could not be fulfilled. He wanted to take back a sample of the volcano material to, at home, but uh, Ptah said, no, you cannot do this. Uh, because of security reasons. And these uh, probes do contain sulfur, bacteria, and uh, perhaps other sources would be interested to get this material. Another occasion, this was uh, about three or four years ago. Uh, Billy visited this, the grave of Mozart. This grave lies outside of Vienna in a remote place, and it's, he is not buried in Vienna, as the people believe. He was uh, buried there by his friend Franz Xaver Süßmeier, it's called. And uh, this, his grave, will never be found. And just for the record, I wrote here, uh, Mozart died of lung tuberculosis, I hope you understand my English. Long-term medical poisoning and Lyme borreliosis after having been bitten by a tick years before. That's a little digression here. Digression. 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 That's, uh, OK. Billy is very busy. He's working seven days a week, makes no vacation, is always always there. Unfortunately, his health has improved very much since his severe accident he had in 1982, when he suffered a severe breakdown and had heavy brain injuries. And uh, he was at the brink of death for many years. And there's, uh, you already heard it, there's much unusual and strange in Billy's life. And this improvement of health from such a severe uh, injury is kind like, uh, of a, like a, a miracle or a wonder, but of course, wonder don't exist. And so there are other reasons behind this. I want to present you a kind of an update of the last 15 years or so. And uh, when I prepared my lecture, I didn't know who will be here, how much you know about this. And uh, so I, I thought I will start with the persons. There are 39 people with whom Billy had contacts since his childhood. You will see then that there are some repetitions. Uh, I didn't know and uh, didn't see Michael's lecture, but uh, 
I heard once that uh, repetition is the mother of all, of all le learning, and so it can you be used for this. And when I say contact, uh, contact, contact persons, this means that at least once Billy had a, contact, had a, a talk, a conversation with this person, and, and uh, also that this person was made of flesh and blood, like we all of here. And not, uh, not uh, mentioned here will be all those many people he met during his travels when he was uh, together with the Priyans on, on the great giant mothership or, or elsewhere. Uh, this picture you know here. No, that's... Uh, I forgot to, uh, <laughs> to change the pictures. This, this picture you have seen already. Uh, Billy had his first contact at the age of five. It was a telepathic one. And uh, then two years later, he had his first contact by an old man, Sfat, you already heard his name. That was the same person that, um, that uh, started the tele telepathic communication two years ago. And this uh, is a sketch made by Ptah, that's the son of Sfat, and from this sketch here, Christian Krukowski made the other one that you just have seen from Michael, and so I'll leave this here. That's another variation. This contact lasted for 11 years, <coughs> and when Sfat died in 1953, his successor was a woman called Eskit, Askit, we are saying in, in German. And the picture you have seen also here from the Dahl universe. And at that time, when Askit came as a new contact person, person uh, Billy was 16 years old. This is also known by you. Contact with Askit lasted for another 11 years, and during the, this time he traveled, as you have heard, um, to Africa, through Europe, Middle East, India, Pakistan, and uh, at one time he had two monkeys, uh, Emperor Hanuman was the name of one. Well, it was very adventurous, very dangerous, his life that he led. And then uh, comes the information about uh, his marriage here. And this was the reason that the daughter here was born in West Pakistan. And then he came back to Switzerland and settled down here. He was at one time, he was a, a watchman. Uh, he made his living as a, as a watchman. So that's the reason why he has this uniform on here. And then, January 28, 1975, the green light went on regarding Billy's mission. The woman, Semyasi, you know her, landed outside of Inwil in Switzerland in a beam ship, and this was then uh, the beginning of, of, the, of the contacts. And so, after a couple of months, Billy, and having been taken, you know, uh, after he could take all um, so, so many photographs, he went to the public and then the worldwide resonance started. Simbiasi, by the way, is Svart's granddaughter and was Billy's main person for many years. There's another microphone. Oh. Sorry. So, I'm sorry, I'm not used to talk about. <laughs> yeah, then, she, um, when uh, Semyasi um, 
had a severe accident at the center. She went to the Dahl Universe for treatment and recovery, and there she will stay for a total of 70 years. Simiasis once returned in 2004 <coughs> together with her friend, friend Asket. Simiasis' uh, home planet is called Era. It's, uh, the system is Plearan, as I that's a plural, and the people have the same name. Uh, the people, that's in German, and you would read it uh, different here. Plejaren, I think you would say, but uh, the correct name is Plejaren. And for uh, the first 15 years, the Plejarens named themselves the, the Pleiadians, or coming from, from, the, from the Pleiades. And the Pleiades are these, the Pleiades that we are seeing on our night sky, and here you don't find any animal or uh, human life. And they had a reason for this, to call them uh, their origin Pleiades, because now when they changed and uh, disclosed their, uh, the information that they are not coming from there, you uh, can now see, can now, uh, see uh, who is talking the truth. And so you can be sure that anyone who claims to be in contact with beings from the Pleiades is either either choking, cheating, or suffering from some form of schizophrenia. <laughs> Billy's main person since Semias's departure is Ptah, here thrown by himself. This is the other version you have seen already like this here. He will remain th the main contact person as long as Billy lives. Ptah is Simiasis' father and Svalt's son. Ptah is about 790 years old and quite familiar with what's going on on Earth here. He is the responsible Ishwish for <coughs> Earth. Ishwish is a title and has the meaning of some king of wisdom, you could say, or he who has reached a very high level of wisdom. That's a, I think that's a better translation because he really is not a king. He's the wish, wish, wish on Era, his home planet, and of the planet Alatides in the Pleiaren system, and here Terra, the other one. An Ishwish, or as an Ishwish, Ptah is the primus inter pares among the spiritual guides of the Pleiaren people. We are on era, there is no government like we know it here on Earth. There are 20, 24,000 spirit guides distributed over the planet. They are uh, working like other people, but they have some great knowledge and uh, they are some, you could say, they are teachers and they teach them the spiritual teachings <coughs> to the population. But on this family, have uh, special connections to Earth because already Ptah's grand, grand, great grandfathers, Gabriel and Hilak, were involved here. Hilak witnessed the great Santorin catastrophe 1453 years before Christ, and Gabriel. He was uh, the extraterrestrial father of Emmanuel that you have already heard before. And regarding uh, Emmanuel, that's uh, an additional information. That's a, a drawing of Emmanuel. He looked like this. And there, the fourth edition of the Talmud, Emmanuel, will come out during this year. At the moment, it's uh, not available and uh, you will get it from, there is the internet address, from Steelmark. And as you heard, James Dierdorf is among us. He is um, involved in the whole, in the whole explanation and distribute, distribution of this, this book, and you see his um, internet address there. 
The next person is Quetzal here also, the first drawing, the other version here. Quetzal is an interesting person. He was much involved during the first years of FIGO, and he was the co-author of FIGO's regulations and guidelines. When Billy met him for the first time, he was the commander of the Pliaren group, who was working here on Earth in their station and in their beam ships. In the meantime, um, Quetzal has uh, become an Ishwish like Pta, and he's also responsible for three planets, one being the sister planet of Era, and two planets in the Harkonnen system. I don't know where it, is, where it is. And Quetzal has four wives and six children. That's uh, Pleia here. She's the sister of Simeasi. And one, uh, in, one peculiar information is that she, wa she once drove uh, Billy's moped. <laughs> That's, uh, yeah, she was uh, in the Dal universe. She is a friend of Asket, and he met her, her there on the Great Voyage. As you may, might know, um, in 1975, Billy was, uh, made a trip throughout the universe for four, five days. He was in the giant beam ship of Pta, and uh, he could make many photographs, and so, and, so, and also he could uh, go to another, another uh, universe. The next person, I may, don't give much information, Rala, Isados, Electra, they are from Era. Then Menara, Alene, you can read, you see it behind, from their own, the Vega, Lyra Vega system, Lyra Vega that we see on, on the sky. Sana Ecto Lumia Ters, just visitors from Druan, from the system, system Null. Then we here, we have Solar, Talide, and Zeltan. Uh, Talide, the middle here, the woman, she had uh, several years, she was a contact person, person with uh, Billy. And then she witnessed, during the Gulf War, she uh, witnessed the terrible atrocities that were, that were done to the people there. And this, uh, uh, she got sick of this in her psyche and she couldn't continue with her work here. And she had to go back to, to recover from the shock from these uh, impressions she got there. Talida has, has uh, blue skin, not blue, yellow skin, uh, yellow, yellowish, like uh, we, we uh, saying uh, the Chinese because she has the same ancestors than the Chinese and Japanese people. And uh, yes. <clears throat> then, I don't know if you heard of Asina. She's from Deneb, from Cygnus, from the Cygnus system. She, uh, this system is 2,000 light years away from the Sol system, and she belongs to an amphibian race. The average lifespan of a race is through 230 years. And Asina resembles a cross between a frog and a fish. And her skin is smooth. And on the back of her head, she has kind of a crest. And she has long fingers, the double length of uh, Billy's or, um, or mine. In November 1977, Asina and her crew were stranded on Earth because of an engine damage. They were technically, they were not very, very good, and they couldn't uh, repair their the ship, and uh, their main, uh, main way of communication was in, uh, telepathically. And through the aid of Billy, um, the Playaren got notice of them and helped them to return to their home planet, um, they were, have, had been on an expedition. And many years later, in 2000, actually on uh, September 26th, Asina made a surprise visit at Billy's place and uh, thanked him for his help 13 years ago. Because at that time, uh, they didn't meet, and so she came back. And 10 days earlier, 
uh, here in uh, we core group member had the sighting in the, it was in the evening about uh, th uh, nine past uh, 30 minutes past nine in the evening when we were outside here where the birch trees there a bit we stood there and then that is direction to the north here to the north ah must look like this and so like this that's the, the north side and there we saw on the sky 21 lights standing low over the horizon and we later learned that this had been the fleet of Asina and her people ready to jump uh, to another place. They were uh, <coughs> making an expedition and they were exploring Earth's neighbor planets. I, uh, only, uh, I also made a photograph then at night with my photo camera, but it was all black only when I processed it because I hadn't a tripod and so these tiny little dots were not, could not be seen. Next here, Florena. Here uh, you see the, the ages of these persons, the two women here, and another, an interesting name, Safinat Panea. That's the man, and he's uh, in a union with the two women here. And Safinat Panea, he's an interesting man in, in so in, um, yeah, that he uh, has learned 23 professions. He occupies himself with terrestrial electronics. His main interests, I read it here, are the extremely fine electronics of the nano and ultra nano technology, as well as subatomic technique and subatomic electronics. He owns a huge collections, collection of computer devices here. I think about for, for the last 20 years, he has every device that was invented here on Earth, he, he owns in his, his collection. He's a computer expert and has a combination of knowledge of all electric, electronic technicians here on Earth. And he is helping us with our computer system. And he, they uh, gave us advice how to uh, prevent uh, intruders in our system. Then, Eniana, she is uh, Safina Panea's representative, and he's away, she is in charge of his tasks. Tauron, he is also one with many professions, 19 in all. He's mainly involved in, with security analysis and biological and technical cybernetics. Sam Young, he is uh, also uh, busy in these technical fields, subatomic va vacuum technology and subatomic crystal physics and crystal technology. <coughs> and he's coming as the leader from um, the Nissan system here, the same ancestors as the Chinese and Japanese people. Sudor is the next one. He's uh, Name means shoemaker, and he has a funny hobby. He makes shoes for himself. He has uh, 18 professions, as he learned, among them ultra subatomic computer technician. Nefratisa is uh, his friend. Fetanika, she is, uh, you can read it, Safinat Pineach's sister, and Tanette. She's Florena's sister. They are here, um, you see, intermingled. Yeah. <coughs> then, the next here, Gaudon and Queda. And a very young person here with 97 years. It's quite a difference to the other persons. That's Inobia. As a surprise, then came visiting him three persons, they are spirit guides here. Melchora, Ulana, two women, and a man, Jaspan. This was in uh, 
2002. For the first time, he had visits from uh, the Spirit Guides uh, community. Naidesha, she was, uh, or he, she is a simple woman from the people. She had the great wish to uh, visit one, once in her lifetime, Billy, and she asked, ah, can I come with you once to, to visit Billy? And he said, yeah, okay, come with, with me. And she's working as a supervisor in a plant for food production. And now I come to the youngest visitor ever, Kladena Aikarina. She's 11 years old. She was last year. She came visiting Billy. And the reason for this was that um, she had won a competition on air, a kind of a survey they made. They were trying to find a, a, a description for Billy's mission, for the mission that uh, Billy and Figo is doing here on Earth. And uh, she, won, uh, she won this competition with this uh, sentence here, or this expression, the silent revolution of truth. And this was accepted by the entire population as, uh, as the name they are using in their chronicles, uh, in their history to um, describe what we are doing here on Earth. On they are helping us. And now I come to the last person that was visiting, that was last month in January this year, Florena's mother. Yeah, she's also from ERA. And uh, with these uh, explanations, I wanted to uh, give you the impression that uh, these are not angels, no exalted or ascended masters, no supernatural beings. They are simple human beings. And uh, that's an important thing to know, that the extraterrestrials are, are beings. They are not, uh, <coughs> not uh, figments of the imagination or something unreal. They are real people driving with a ship and so on, coming in this way. And uh, perhaps one last, last example for uh, this um, kind of uh, simple or uh, human, human touch in, with these people. Pta, as the, I told you, as the, the chief, not actually the chief, the primus inter pares of the whole federation, he owns the a complete collection of all postal stamps that have ever been printed here on Earth in all countries. And I don't think that the supernatural human being or a supernatural being would have a hobby at all. And now, let's turn from this kind of who is who's who to the flying objects and the persons. Uh, yeah, and the beam ships, as they are called. Beam ships, it's a kind of a, an antique expression because it tr traces back or goes back to the time when they were propulsed with, with, with a beam. Uh, they had a beam propulsion. That is not the case anymore. The Billy Meyer case, I think, is uh, most famous because of these pictures here of the UFOs. That uh, many people are intrigued by this or are fascinated by this. And uh, there have been many, many pictures taken by Billy. And a huge amount, actually. And if I say a huge amount, that's, uh, that's the case. Like this. And I give you here a few examples. That's the first hundred here. Um, The picture vanishes here in, in my screen. I have to use the mouse. Hmm. 
I cannot see this. Ah, it's a, here you see the several ships here. Yeah. Then uh, here. There's a whole series here with the tripod. <coughs> From these scenes, there are existing eight millimeter films as well as photographs and. Another hundred here, you see uh, here the hole that he shot with a laser pistol through the apple tree, or here are uh, traces of his footsteps in the beginning in the middle of a field coming to the, to the, to the way out of the field. Here you see uh, uh, traces of an elf in the, in the, the clay. Here you see landing tracks, and the, the ice was burned here in the parking lot. And there were over, uh, over 1,000 photos have been uh, either stolen or have been um, destroyed by Quetzal. Uh, nearly all of the photographs he took, more than 1,000 during his great voyage, uh, were taken, uh, were manipulated by external forces after having been sent to the processing laboratory, and then um, Quetzal took them all and destroyed them. Uh, next pictures here. Here is the wedding cake ship. You see here the mouse. Billy was sitting on one of the ships, and the, the remote control the little one here was uh, flying around, and he could photograph it. Here you see at the top of a, of a tree that the ship broke down, and then the, 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 the juice flew out in streams here, and the, the, the wood, wood uh, went open. Next one here, bio, opla, bioorganic ships here, or metal samples here from other planets. Um, that's uh, just uh, some of these uh, many photos he made and that are available from FIGU. That's the, actually the last, or the, one of the last pictures Billy made here from the wedding cake, wedding cake ship, as it is called. Uh, in the early 80s, Billy stopped making photographs of the beam ships and he had then his accident and so uh, for uh, nearly 15 years no photos were made anymore from, from beam ships. And so we were uh, pleased of course when uh, in 1998 core group member Edith Beldi was able to uh, make this photo here. You see this ship here flying. She wasn't aware when she made the photo that uh, Florina was up there. Florina tried the whole day to, to bring her ship to the attention of Edith, but she didn't look up in the sky. She had <laughs> eyes for other things. And so uh, we were, of course, we were lucky then and happy to have this picture here. Next one, just about three weeks later, there was the, no, that's the, uh, an enlargement of the ship here. And then just about three weeks later, we had the passive meeting at Schmidrüti where all the passive members came together and then on Sunday they made a visit, uh, a, a walk here, these three people, and Bernhard Kal Kalner photographed them here and it was also not noticed that there was a ship up here. Yeah, so here. They only uh, found this uh, peculiar here after uh, having gotten back the, 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 the film, the photos. And so uh, it was a, a year later they brought it back to Schmidrüti. And then it was uh, analyzed, this picture here by the Pleiarns. That's a, 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 an analyze an analyze made by the Pleiarns and then cop copied by Billy. That's not, uh, he doesn't own the original of this. Uh. And it was, uh, here the information about this, Canon. It was 
showing Florena's beam ship just at that instant when the protection shield changed its frequency to not being detected by another, uh, an, another foreign beam ship. They had at the same time another ship had been up there making ob observations and the Pleans had a, a higher, higher technology and while cha changing the frequency, the back of their ship was visible and so you s it was kind of a coincidence that uh, they got on the photograph. <coughs> Next picture shows uh, Zafinat Banir's ship. You cannot see that it's a ship. It was a, a silvery dot in the sky that was driving by, or flying by. Zafinat Banir and, Sa and Samyang were in it. And uh, earlier that evening, um, another ship was flying by, the highest, then uh, an airplane, and beneath five uh, hot air balloons. And so what you see here on the left side here, this, um, that's the, the top of the flagpole. Freddy Croft made this photograph, it's a 500 millimeter telelens up like this, beneath, uh, just by the, the, the flagpole, and Billy asked that he put the flagpole top also in the picture. So you, that's the shade, the white shade here. Then uh, you use the next two pictures are made by me. Here. I had uh, also one, one of my sightings. This war has been in uh, May 20, 2000. We were called that uh, there was a ship up there at the sky. I had my photo camera at hand and so make a photograph, but uh, my tele lens was not good enough and so uh, you cannot see the ship here, but you see the weather. It was uh, very sunny, a sunny evening. There was a, a tiny silvery dot up there in the sky and it was not moving, but the clouds were moving. And then uh, at one time there was a second silvery ship up there and we could uh, see this for half an hour. And so I thought, if I don't see the, I cannot photograph the ship, I will photograph the witnesses. There were 17 in all, but here uh, you see just a, a few of them. Here you see, uh, they are from four different countries here, from Canada, that's Silvano Lehmann, here <coughs> behind is Billy here. And he is looking here with a, with a lens. Yeah. Then, I told you that Billy stopped making photographs since 1981 or 1980. And then we got notice of a man from the Pirk. The Pirk, it's the region around Schmidrüti. It's called, it's, uh, it's a, a native name. He was able to, do, to uh, make the best photographs since the, since the 80s. He was there up above the center. For four years, he told us later, or told Billy later, again and again, he was there, sitting up there on the center's ground or above, uh, and trying or be prepared to see um, beam ships. He, on, on the one hand, he was interested or fascinated by the thought, and uh, he was also a little bit skeptic. And so in the night of June 5th, 2001, at 50 past midnight, he was sitting there and had his camera ready on the tripod and he was able to shoot these five photographs here of Abdar's ship. He was able to do this because Abdar had analyzed his thoughts, he recognized and, and detected him sitting there and they found that his, gen his interest was genuine, and so I uh, decided to give him a demonstration. And very uh, interesting that the same man was able to make photographs again, two and a half me uh, months later, at daylight, two photographs of Star's ship. 
Yeah, you know, the man then came to Billy, told him his story, showed him the photographs, and uh, requested that he, Billy, will keep his name a, a secret. He doesn't want to know to be known there around because he doesn't want to be called a UFO nutcase or Schmidt UFO nutcase, and he is he's in fear of his. Uh, wife because she told that his wife is very religious, looks upon UFOs as satanic things which are steered by Satan personally in order to prepare the souls for hell. And so he uh, said, I don't want that my na name is uh, being published. Here's the last picture I will show you of, the, of such a newer photographs of beam ships that's in uh, Vienna. And the castle is called Belvedere Castle in Vienna, Austria. Josef Gruber, he was photographed by his wife. She's a core group member. They didn't see the ship while making the photo, and we later learned. And this has happened several times. We have also several group members could, have, could make photographs of beam ships, but uh, I don't have the time to show you show you all of them. The Priaren have always been very careful to not show themselves or their ships too close to persons. And this has been for a good reason, as has shown, uh, or has been proven by a tragic incident. Um, yeah, here. You see Okay, here you see the center, that's the hill above the center, here he is Schmidrütti, and uh, there goes a road behind this hill here, down to Schmidrütti, down to the valley, to Vila, and here, Ptah noticed that uh, three men drove the street every day to go to work, and he uh, overheard <coughs> They're speaking there, and they made uh, remar derogatory remarks about Billy and his contacts. And so, on that day, when he uh, saw them once again passing by and, and, and joking about Billy and, and making their remarks, he had a whim to show his ship to the three men. And then, about a month later, Billy received several urgent telephone calls from two of the three men. Yeah, two men were, have, been, uh, have been brothers. And uh, so uh, he learned that one of the brothers couldn't cope with this, uh, with this uh, experience. Being of a very strong Catholic faith, he could not match his experience with his belief, and his mental state got worse and worse. So after the second suicide attempt, while being in a coma, he was sent to the hospital. When Billy informed Da on that same day, Da felt deeply startled and immediately went to the hospital and de deleted from within the man's memory the entire experience. When the man woke up, from his coma, he did not remember his experience, could not explain why he was in the hospital. He was then brought to a mental hospital for recovery and therapy. And then the other two men and the three wives apologized, of course, for their former negativity towards Billy. But they also want to keep, be kept uh, a secret and their names not be mentioned because they have fear of the other, or the other people. The next incident, I... Uh, I don't want to talk uh, more in detail. Michael already told to you, Sistana and Dupral. What I can add, perhaps, is that uh, these people are, uh, are uh, about this height here, 110 to 120 centimeters. They have light green skin and a hairless body. And uh, the seven fingers, you already know. Billy had met them three times before, and so he knew when he saw these uh, imprints here uh, that this must be uh, these tree lands. And it's very interesting, it's now four 
Eight seasons have passed since then, and you still see these imprints, the popular lines on the metal, like in the first day. What you have seen today, or most of them what you have heard today, is, I would say, is the tip of an iceberg. The extraterrestrial visitors, flying objects, photos and footage, landing tracks, metal samples, all this is uh, the tip of the iceberg. And uh, as you know, the, the biggest part of the iceberg there is li uh, lies uh, hidden beneath the surface. And I have prepared here a few pictures. The whole body that lies hidden is the facts about the origin of man and the universe, information on health, disease and politics, plenty of, plenty, scientific information, prophecies and predictions, information about the origin of religions and their effects on the human beings. And instructions of improving one's own development and evolution. I ask myself how could uh, the teaching of Billy and Figu that are disseminated on this world um, summarized and I can make these statements here as you see. It's creation. Creation is the all-encompassing force, the non-personal universal consciousness. It's not a person which is in its immeasurable greatness and mightiness gave birth to the spiritual laws that enable our universe and all galaxies, planets and life forms to exist and evolve. The, uh, it, and it, it brings the, the laws that enable this. That's uh, important, that's no person. <coughs> and each human being is connected to creation through, through, through a tiny fragment of creative spirit located in our brain. The spiritual part in us, it's like the, at the battery of our cells, is immortal and incarnates again and again in different bodies and with different personality. This process is lasting for billions of years. Also. All of us here will never be born again, our personalities, but there is a part of us that will be born again and, and continue to exist. Everything that we do, think and feel is stored in a fine matter storage bank and accessible by our own consciousness during following existences of our spirit form. This has to do with reincarnation. And there is no higher entity or power between the human beings and creation. Creation and then the human beings and the animals, of course, everything, life. Consequently, there is no one above who punishes us human beings for our deeds or our sins. We punish ourselves through the result of our thoughts and actions. And as has been said before, that's the law of cause and effect. If we do something that's not right, that's not correct, we feel remorse, we feel bad, we feel have a bad conscience. And that's the direct punishment or direct effect of what we are doing, and we should use this to learn, not do it again, to, to make it better the next time. And there is no su such thing as karma. That's uh, also one of the main, main uh, realizations. The human being's main purpose is to learn from his mistakes and gather knowledge and wisdom during all of his her lifetime, and very important, each human being is solely responsible for the deeds, for what one is thinking, what one is doing, and we are also responsible for what we are not doing. We could sometimes, we could do something, but don't do it, that we are also responsible. The prophets of old did not... Uh, write down the teachings. 
There were other people around who heard what the, the prophets were saying and were then uh, writing it down from, from memory and so. And this is uh, not the case anymore. The knowledge that we receive, what Figo is uh, disseminating, comes from two sources, of course, uh, extraterrestrial friends, Billy's contacts, contact persons, and the second source of this knowledge is Billy's ability to have access to the oldest fine matter storage bank in the universe, reaching back billions of years. If uh, we take this source number one, since January 28, 1975, until, here you see, 808 personal contacts have occurred between Billy and his extraterrestrial friends, 1,004 telepathic contacts, and of all of those 1,812, 410 are documented. They are documented in this here. These are 4,000 pages. That's the newest edition of the contact notes here, with pictures in it. Here, uh, yeah. Each book has 500 pages. Yeah, and what's interesting, these have been corrected with the aid of the Pleiarans. Since uh, several years, once a week, here, Bernadette Brandt, our secretary, is reading here uh, the contact from the computer. Billy sits beside her with the, the original, original notes he typed with his typewriter or la later with his computer. And above in the beam ship is either Pta, Florena, or Adriana participating in this process and they give telepathically uh, corrections through Billy. And he says, stop, here is a word is missing and so on. They are they are uh, reading their own, uh, their own contacts. I have to hurry a bit here. Uh, source number two that I mentioned is, of course, Billy's uh, books. He has written si with the, since uh, 1975 about 40 books. And uh, these are one of the, a uh, couple of them. And I calculated this before I came here. From Figure, there are 24,000 pages of information available in German, and about 500 pages in English, and not counted here are the Guido's Mosbrucker's book and the Talmud Immanuel. <clears throat> and what is not known to most here, I think, is that Billy started writing uh, spiritual teachings for the Pleiarans in 2001. And in this period, you can read it, he wrote 6,812 pages. At the moment, he is answering 1,400 questions they brought him. It's a bit quite of a task, and he hopes to, to finish it by the end of this year. This uh, mission of Billy's and the teachings and the information, you heard already something from uh, from Wendell and from Michael, uh, seem to be uh, not so um, uh, very uh, agreeable uh, with certain persons. So uh, Billy had uh, to uh, experience 21 assassinations attempts since nine, the first one was in 1964 in India. Uh, only the, the uh, mission related are here. He had other other ones as well, and. Uh, here, I thought I will bring you a couple of photos from the number 20. Uh, in the, the afternoon here, they uh, saw Billy and Silvano Lehmann saw a man on the center's ground appearing, and then when they wanted to go to him, he, he went away. And then in the evening, uh, Billy heard a sound. He was sitting in the kitchen, a, a click outside, and he went out. And, came here to the lamp, the lamp. OK. 
Can I have the... Oh, thank you. I see it here in the monitor. It's the mouse. He, here on the left is the kitchen behind this uh, corner here. The lamp was shining here. He came up and then a shot rang from this direction that we see here and nearly hit him, but not, luckily not directly. And that's the other direction. Here is a, a trailer. And here the person must have been stood here and shot in this direction. And then here you see the, the window and here the hole. And that's the bullet here, the left one, the remains of the bullet that hit the wall. And then I can show you uh, no, uh, something of the 19th assassination attempt. This has happened at 3 in the morning. Silvano and Billy were on the parking lot uh, when suddenly uh, Billy was hit here in the kidney area by uh, this knife here. And luckily it turned, uh, he was hit by the, the back here of the, of the knife. And so uh, he had a, a bad uh, back here for a couple of days, but uh, he survived. And Wendell is among us. He was a witness of the 10th assassination attempt. They were sitting here in front of the house at the center in 1980, this had been. And you, here you see the distance between the, 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 the bullet and the wall. And, uh, in, and Billy's head. And so it's uh, to be a, a disseminator of the truth and of this knowledge is quite dangerous. But he never said to himself, I will, I will quit my task and will, uh, will stop doing, doing my mission. That's not Billy's nature. Uh, I come. My time is up, I see here. Uh, the Billy Meyer case is not sim uh, simply a UFO case that you have already realized, I think. It's a generalistic case for the whole of mankind. And so uh, I think what I bring you here in shortly is uh, the biggest threats to mankind. The Pleiarns are it's a great concern to, to them how uh, our, our uh, politics are working and everything. There are so much trouble here on Earth, and so the biggest threats to mankind are uh, listed here. I listed them here as are certainly overpopulation is the first one, terrorism and fanaticism, then interference in the affairs of foreign states, wasting of resources, wrong persons in governments, and the thinking a tooth for a tooth and an eye for an eye, that's, uh, there is revenge behind this and, and, and hate and everything. That's the biggest threats. And uh, all population lies at the root of all great problems and its consequences. The biggest, the biggest, uh, thank you. Yeah, and if the growth of the human population is not coming to an immediate standstill and then to a decrease, the already non-reversal damages will grow even further because that's really a big problem. And I uh, have here the, the latest number of the terrestrial population. It's 7.5 billion people. And I looked at the Census Bureau in the United States they are counting at the moment 6.4 or 6.5 billion. That's 1 billion less than it's the actual numbers because uh, the Pyarns uh, are always uh, have the actual numbers of living human beings on Earth. They have biogram devices that uh, can show them uh, who is alive, alive and who is not. And uh, uh, one million or one billion people more, that's a, a really big problem. And uh, urgent actions are a necessity. And here I list a few uh, solutions. We don't only uh, name the, the problems, you also have solutions, but they are not very easy, of course. 
this one here to uh, make it, uh, bring it to a reality all over the world. I don't think this will happen within the next week. Intervention into foreign countries must be stopped immediately. That's oh, nothing new for you. The war mongering leaders must be removed from their offices. The people should, uh, there are elections, and uh, they should uh, do their, their, their work correctly. And each country is responsible to solve their own problems themselves. We don't have to get into other people, to other countries and tell them what they, they must do if they don't ask. Stop with the piling of debt, that's a, also a big problem. Forming a multinational peace fighting troop, not uh, under the command of one country, but uh, in a different form. Dissolution of all political parties. Today, uh, the, uh, the politicians, most of them, are just uh, working for being re-elected the next uh, elections and so, and that's not a good, uh, not good basis for, uh, for a good uh, government. And so, uh, just as each human being is responsible for his thoughts, feelings, and actions, and for the results, this is also true for each nation and humankind as a whole. Each change is beginning in individuals and not in the masses. That's uh, very important. All of us that we are sitting here, it must begin within ourselves, and so in this uh, respect, I think I can say to you that may peace be within you and grow through you. That's uh, time's up. I read here. Thank you. And uh, now there is a coup and a, I think it's called, question and answers now. And here we have a microphone, and now Wendell and Michael are coming to the stage, and we are ready to answer your questions. But you, it is important that you come here to the microphone then and ask your questions. And these books here are for sale. I don't want to take them back to Switzerland. Uh, they are uh, volume 1 to 8, and one, all of them are costing $320, and each $40. Get a chair. Can I have a chair? Gentlemen, thank you for. Microphone. I don't think the mic. Oh, there we go. Gentlemen, thank you for the talk. Uh, it's very, very been very interesting. I've been following the Billy Meyer case for quite some years now. Um, what I wanted to know was: was there a plan as to why Billy was chosen and not anybody else, particularly? Is it because maybe he ha is more um, uh, psychically uh, evolved, possibly, that uh, is why Samyasi and, and the others chose him to uh, get in contact with him? Yeah, he was chosen because it, was, um, it has to do with his um, spirit form and his, with the tasks that has been done uh, before in former incarnations of his spirit form. And so he was suitable for those days. He wasn't chosen. Somehow it was, uh, it was, uh, it was cause and effect also because it was his task. Is this? Uh, yeah. mm. <laughs> um, in terms of uh, Plehoran responsibility, 
Why are the Plaharans so involved in assisting Earth humanity to spiritually progress instead of any other ET races? And number two, and I'd, if, you, if each of you could address that in your own personal way. And number two, how does our spiritual involvement and self-responsibility help the Plaharans? I don't know. Can you hear me? No, this is none, huh? Um, yeah. It's on suddenly. Uh, part of my understanding of why the play Iron are involved is because their forefathers, in many cases, were the gods of our antiquity. In some cases, they were the forefathers of some of our own people or these distant gods and distant forefathers of the Pleiaren were involved in different things going on at different times on the planet with some of the indigenous or already present slowly evolving human beings here. Mm -hmm. Well, there appears to have been a, a, a great presence here, a greater presence than now before in the history of this planet. There's a story of a visitation, a major visitation that came 60,000 years ago under a Pleharan leader, Arhus. He brought 60,000, or 60,000 years ago, he brought 200 advanced spirits with him at the time that set up little fiefdoms all over the world in contact with Earth humanity. And it appears that Billy was one of those at that time. Uh, is that Sound right. Uh, he was involved many from many incarnations in spirit form, but uh, I cannot tell you all. He was in a different uh, different times. Uh, his spirit form as Henoch and Henoch and uh, and I. Uh, but uh, Enoch was one of our major prophets in biblical history. These. Books down here, by the way, are the contact notes. <clears throat> Since I left off at the 100th contact, there are books like this for those contacts too, but Christian only brought those since I finished the uh, translations that we were doing at about 100, and they go up to about what contact now in this stack here? This is the, to uh, 340. Contact number 340, and there's a lot more of the same kind of information in these books that has never been published anyplace else in, except in German. These are in German, yeah? Yes. <laughs> Astronomers divide our sky up into constellations for convenience. What constellation is Pleiaren in? Pleiaren, where they are. Uh, well, uh, you cannot see them, the Pleiaren because they are located in, if you look at the Pleiades, at the night sky, you have to go to jump, you make the jump in the, into the other dimension and go further about 80, 80, uh, 80 light years. Yeah, 500 million. Yeah, but it, <coughs> the, the um, constellation the, has nothing to do with distance. It's just the location in, this, in our sky. Not is it a, near Lyra? It's not on our sky that we see. It's not on our sky. You cannot see them from Earth because they are a fraction of a second in the future. So you have to change the, the, the dimension to get there. But where, what constel, the constel, the sky is divided up into constellations like counties. You know, I think the, what, what Christian is saying is, where we see the Pleiades in the night sky in, the, in, in Taurus, is it? Mm -hmm. Beyond that, we beyond can't the, see, but it's beyond okay. that direction. Okay. And then you take a right and you go another 80. Okay, mm. thank you. Are, uh, are you aware of any uh, freedom of information requests to get um, any of the documents the government might have in reference to the Billy Meyer case? I didn't understand. Any freedom of information requests on the documents that the government might have on the Billy Meyer case. Uh, Wendell, you well, know something about that. Yeah, they, uh, we understand that the government has a large file of information on the Pleiades case. <clears throat> when, uh, 
when Jim Delatosa was invited to a major meeting in, in Phoenix involving the CFR and the Council of Foreign Relations and the Bendenbergs and a bunch of other uh, powers behind the government, uh, he was told at a break uh, in that session, one of the men next to Jim leaned over to him and said, I understand you uh, studied the Meyer pictures. And Jim said, yes. And the man says, uh, <clears throat> you know, we tried to get a, into that case, tried to get an agent in there and just couldn't do it. So we uh, acquired a property above and looking down on the Meyer property in Switzerland where we set up a round-the-clock watch, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, for five years. And he said, we actually photographed the ships over the Meyer property several times. And he said to Jim, he said, I'll try to get you one of those. And Jim said, oh, man, I would love to have something like that. But he never got it. And we never heard another thing from that man. He said that he was a member of the CFR in the, the, the part of the CFR that was studying the Meyer case. Yeah, and we know that uh, the Pleon said that our newsletter is read by the governments, and they don't like everything in it. There are some information that they don't like, and so. But we are monitored by uh, by government agencies, of course. And you know, that's good, as you said. Uh, that's fine. They shall do this. Yes, uh, I've been very impressed tonight with the presentation. There's information I've never heard of before, and it about blew me over. However, I wanted to just make a couple of comments of a debunker by the name of Cal Korf, who came up with some very clever uh, comments up in Seattle about five years ago. And one of them was that he started off with that he went over there to you know check them out and take a look, and he supposedly couldn't find the city. It was it wasn't on the map where Meyer lives, and so. He went to the library, he said, they ought to know, and he says, oh, you must be going to see Billy. Why do you, why do, oh, does he come in here? Oh, yeah, he gets books on trick photography. Well, that's very clever. Okay, the next one was um, he showed a picture which he duplicated with a saucer hanging from a balloon next to a tree where some pictures supposedly were taken before, and it was hanging on a cord, and of course it has a little tippy-tippy bit, but it showed a jet looked like it was coming in diving on the saucer. Well, in actual practice, uh, he claimed that uh, there are jets in an airport behind that there's coming in for a landing, and if he placed the saucer just right, it looked like the jet was diving on the saucer. Have you ever heard this story? And has Billy had some pictures showing us a jet diving on a saucer? Uh, I've never seen one, but okay. I know that Cal Corf was rigging a lot of things. And, and alleging that that was uh, Billy's uh, Yeah, he contrived work. that very cleverly. That was very cleverly done. If you look at the first book that he wrote, a yellow-covered paperback book sponsored by Bill Moore, by the way, uh, he described, he said, he claimed that Billy was suspending the, the saucer, his model, between two balloons, and he showed the two arrows indicating the two balloons in a picture in our picture book, and those two balloons that he's showing were far apart. They weren't balloons. They were uh, mishandled color separation plates at the printer's shop. They, didn't, they weren't using white lint-free gloves and masks when they were handling the, the, the color separation plates, which they should have been doing. And they're talking over the plates and remarking on what they're seeing there. And in any kind of talk, there's little spittle drops that fly out in the air. That's what those are. When they dry on the inner negative, they look like they have a, a sharper outer edge. They look like a little balloon. And he's claiming that those flaws in the, the, the technique were balloons. But what would happen if you had two gas balloons out here and you hung a penny on a string between them? How long do you think the balloons would stay out in distance like that, long enough for yeah. you to take pictures? By the way, were you in, uh, um, in South Dakota about five years ago at a, uh, at a UFO convention? No. Okay, so, so somebody else, right? There, there's a couple other things about the CalCorf thing. If you uh, go to my website, the They Fly website, there's a link to James Deardorff's website and to Jerome Jansen, both of whom have diligently debunked virtually every line of CalCorf's books, plus 
Two years ago, I was in Santa Clara at the Bay Area UFO conference, and a guy came up to me who was, did graphic arts or something, and he had given me his card. I don't know if I still have it. He had been approached by Korf to do some graphic work, and Korf said, what would it take to make this thing look like it was suspended by strings? And I, if, if he was telling the truth, that was pretty odious. But you can read the debunking done by Jim Deerdorf and by Jerome Jansen and discover for yourself. Christian, this is for you. Um, you said you joined FIGU in 1987? Yes. Um, could you tell me a little bit about um, what brought you to join the FIGU and what kind of job you had at the time and possibly now. I, I, I'm not sure what you do exactly. And um, can you tell us a little bit about the work that you do at the center? Um, I have been interested in UFOs, of course, in extraterrestrial life. And uh, actually, I came to uh, the Billy Meyer case through America because I um, I read in a, an American newspaper about the photo, the book, coffee table book then, and uh, when I went to a, a bookstore in Zurich, suddenly I saw this book and then I bought it. There was no address in it, but finally I found Billy Meyer, and so I was first, I was a passive member and then a core group member. Um, are you talking about the Lee Elder's book? That you saw? Yes. That? And that's what you meant? The, foot, like, the, the big one here. Okay. Mm -hmm. So what made you decide to join FIGU? I mean, did you, after you met Billy or? I didn't understand. What was the reason you joined the core group? The core group, yeah, I wanted to, uh, I, 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 I learned that this was the real thing. I was searching all my life, uh, not all my life, since I was 20, for um, what is true what can be, uh, re what is real. And then I, I, certain, I, I knew when I started to, to read the contact notes and the books, I, I knew that I have found the, uh, the real thing. Okay. By the way, they have just republished that picture book that uh, uh, Christian mentioned <coughs> in Germany. Well, actually it was published here, but it was republished with the original, with the with the transparencies for the publication made from the original slide transparencies. And those were the cleanest edits I've ever seen. Michael Horn has some of those on his table back there, but the, the resolution in, in the, that book that was published uh, just recently is so much better than the resolution we had. And if you compare the two pictures that we're talking about, the, the, where the little spittle drops are, there's nothing like that in the new book. Yeah, uh, we got the message that we have to conclude, so a couple quick things. Uh, I, I know Christian is here till Tuesday, yeah? Tuesday morning. Tuesday morning, so effectively through tomorrow. And Wendell, you're here for all week, yeah? And I leave on, on Wednesday, but I think I can speak for all of us. Uh, no, I'm kidding. And say that uh, we would be happy to talk to you outside of here and tomorrow or a little tonight or what have you. Uh, the photo book is available through my website. Um, anything we can do to give you information or help, happy to do it. Can you give one more question in? I, I think they've called a halt to it. But one I, more question. Oh, you guys can go. Oh, we can. Yeah, one can more question. Oh, because they, they had a time's up on the thing. One more question. That was, that's an error. We can go. We can do it So okay. until they say it wasn't an error. Okay. I, I've studied... Um, the Pleiadian works comprehensively, um, but there's a, a certain group, a certain school that says that they're referred to as Pleiadians. Have you heard about this concept? And the, the fact that the Pleiadians information is a disinformation attempt, and the Pleiadian is uh, more towards truth. Okay, you know, from the very beginning, Billy was calling them play Right. And when we released the information in the United States here in English, we called them Pleiadians because they came from a star group that we called the Pleiades. Uh -huh. We knew the difference and we, we left it that way for a very good reason. There were two other things that we used to see, to, 
to check on feedback from what we were releasing. One, we, we continued to call them Pleiadians, whereas we knew that they were Pleiharans. If anybody else came along and was channeling Pleiadians, we knew that it wasn't the same okay. Okay. ones that were contacting Julie. As long as you recognize it, Pleihar Pleiharans? Pleiharans was what they were called. And that name comes from a, a uh, Illyrian expeditionary that arrived in the Pleiades on, uh, by the name of Plehara. That's important information. And uh, the, play, the stars were named after him because he uh, led the engineering of the stars to make them habitable. And uh, he, you know, an interesting thing in, the, in Burnham's Encyclopedia of Astronomy, there's three volumes that covers all the stars known. And they give the origins of the star names for most of the stars in our catalog. But they have an entry for the Pleiades that says, name unknown, origin of name unknown. So the argument that they've given Billy is probably as good as any, that they were named after Plehara, and Pleiades is the anglicized version of it. Uh, those books represent an enormous amount of work. Uh, of presenting uh, the contact notes uh, to humanity. It's, it's wonderful. Uh, I, so I, I, I assume there's more than eight that's out there. And I'm, I'm just impressed by uh, the amount of work. Unfortunately, it's only in German. Yeah. So obviously, Mr. Stevens' work uh, of four volumes, the first hundred uh, contacts, uh, is the only uh, English translation of that many uh, contacts that I'm aware of. And I'm uh, curious if we couldn't get an official version of at least the contacts that, uh, the translation that Mr. Stevens has brought out. Well, let me, let me tell you how difficult it was to get the translations we had. We started with uh, a lady that took me to the case in the first place. She, she was a, Germ an, a, a Swiss journalist, wrote, read, and, and published in five different languages in Switzerland. And uh, she took me to meet Billy, and, and uh, she offered to translate. When I wanted to maintain contact with him, she, offered, she said, if you'll write me the letter in English, I'll translate it and send it to Billy. And, he, and he'll answer it in German and send it to you. That was before I met Billy. So I sent several letters to her first, and she did this. And then she, the time came after about the fourth letter. She said, this is getting to be too much for me. I'm going to have another friend of mine, also a multilingual journalist in Germany, and it speaks and reads and writes five languages, Ilse von Jacobi, to uh, translate some. So Ilse translated some more letters between me and Billy. So when I got the first German ver notes, contact notes from Billy, 1,800 pages of them. I went first to Lou Zinstag and asked her if she would translate the first two contact notes for me so I could see what they said in English. She did, and I took them back to Billy and sat down with him to correct them, and he says, oh, this is not right, this is not right, this is not right, this is not right, scratch things out. Then he raised his eyes and he says, you know, this woman is a born-again Christian, and she, she's seeing all the information through Christian eyes. He says, that's not correct. There, there are too many errors. Can't use that. So I went back to Ilspan Jacobi and had her, trans her translate the same two articles, same two contact notes, and took them back to Billy again, and he says, no, that's not right. That's not right. This is not understood right. That's not right. And he said, he raised his eyebrows again. He said, this woman is a, is a theosophist. She sees things only in terms of the philosophy of the mystic masters of the Far East. He says, that's not correct either. So then we went to a German scholar, that, that, a college student that only spoke, or claimed he spoke English. We asked him to translate the same paragraphs, and he did again. When I took that back to Billy, he did the same thing, and he said, you know, this man is stuck with Einsteinian physics, and the Einsteinian physics are not correct. So we're really stuck there. And so we asked a young man that was living in a community like Christian here at the time that uh, spoke English reasonably well to see what he could do with them. And he, did, he translated the same two contact notes. I took those to Billy, and he did less crossing out, and he made some corrections, and he said, this is 
probably the best we can do with the sources you've got. So the obvious question is why haven't those been authenticated? Well, uh, in the first place, the Billy's, the, the, the language that these were co originally communicated in is, a, is not a common form of German. It's Swiss German spoken on the border. And it's like uh, Welsh English or Scotch English. Uh, even Englishmen can't understand them. So when we go to German translators, they have to be aff aff fluent in the language on the border. There are colloquialisms that just don't translate. And no, I mean, the translations that you've made, the hundred contacts that you've already had translated, why can't we get those authenticated, corrected, and, well, and turned into uh, acceptable form? Okay, because we reached the point where we didn't have any other way to go with the translations, and to put anything out in English, we would have to take the best that we had, which Billy didn't want published. He says they, are, they don't read correctly in English, and he didn't want me to publish them, but I published the first volume anyway, and everybody was interested in the next one. And I did it to the whole 1,800 pages I had. Now this stack here represents 6,000 pages, and you can come. These will be on my table tomorrow, and you can come look at these books and see what's in them in German. But they have to be read in German to really be understood. And they must be translated now. Every translation must now be done from these here because there is much additional information that has not been in before, and sometimes there was a, a not in the German or. And, and, totally the, the opposite. And so, uh, and if, uh, if you know someone who will do in the, making the translation, who is paying, we don't have, we have the money to pay anybody to do a translation. Uh, everybody who is skilled is welcome. Uh, Christian, this question is for you, and I'm, I'm gonna repeat it, because uh, it's, it's very important for me to understand this. Uh, in terms of Playharan responsibility, why are the Playharans so involved in assisting Earth humanity to spiritually progress, especially instead of any other ET races, to your best understanding? But why they are involved? In terms, in terms of the Playharan responsibility, uh, do they bear, do the Playharans have a responsibility? Are they here? Um, because they feel they need to correct something that they did in the past? Or are they here mm -hmm. solely to help us on their own volition? And why the play Harans as opposed to the multitude of other ET races that are out there in the universe? Well, let me start that while Christian's thinking about it. Uh, it's my understanding that the play Harans, the Pleiadians, that are visiting Billy Meyer, consider this planet almost as much theirs as they do ours. They have had colonizations here a number of times in the past where they grew quite big and then evacuated the planet for one reason, usually before cataclysmic disturbances. So those Playharans do consider this planet of great substantial interest to them and an old home for them also. Is that correct? Yeah, it has to do with what has already been said, that their ancestors had done certain actions here on Earth that brought troubles to the, the, the earthborn, earth-created people, war and diseases and all kind of things. And so they have, feel kind of responsible for the deeds of their forefathers. And uh, uh, that's then the main, the main reason. So how does, how does our involvement, how does our spiritual involvement and self-responsibility help the Plaharans? How will that help them? Yeah, they feel connected with all, all human beings on, all over the universe. And so uh, if we are doing correct, you, you ha if, if in a family all the, all the members are doing well, you have you, you, you rejoice and you're glad. And, and if the, the, a family member makes trouble, you are, um, have a bad feeling. And so it's the same if they see that the, uh, a population is thriving and doing good, making progress that's a reward by itself. There's, there's a part of it where some people have had the idea uh, lurking that there was some negative agenda by the play R and or what have you. But someone else raised an interesting point, and that is, even if you look at the contacts with Billy that go back for more than 64 years, 
64 years ago, we were less technologically advanced. Our weapons were less technologically developed. If this had been a hostile intention, they would have had a far easier time any time in the past taking over. So maybe the way we think about what's in it for me is not the same way they think because they're also not from, they're not obsessed with collecting green pieces of paper. They have freedom to travel in space and maybe in time and to do things that go beyond simply trying to acquire things and possess them. It's not that extraterrestrial people are immune, I'm sure, from craving power, but this group, from what we can see here, appears to have mastered that lower level of concern of human beings and having true freedom and high responsibility, they wish to see others step up just like we do for anybody that we can assist without t you know, doing something for someone. Thank you, I feel much more satisfied with that answer. Thanks, gentlemen. Hi, that actually ties right into my question, which is um, since they are physical beings, you know, beings, and they have physical needs, I am very interested in how other cultures on other planets deal with economics, their whole sort of social structure. Um, do they have jobs? Do they get paid? Or, or is it, can you speak to what, how their society functions? I can start, uh, I think Christian will know more, but this is what I have gleaned from investigating the, the, the work that's been done by others on the case, and that is that they have whatever they require, providing they give of themselves their work and service to their society. I think that there's a, something like a two-hour contribution per day by everybody. They don't elevate their most spiritually evolved leaders into any exclusive hierarchy where they're immune from contributing to their society. So where we have people, as Christian was alluding to, politicians that try to get into positions of personal comfort and, and uh, pensions and all the rest, their most evolved and teachers and spiritual leaders and what have you are of the same status otherwise in their world. And they contribute to the well-being of their world and they get what they need from it. So they must have one other thing that I think of, and then I want to, because I think Christian will have more to say about it. I think if we truly could see how they live, we'd be enormously depressed, really, because we would see that for at least 10,000 years, we've had a planet with only 250 years of peace. We're constantly warring with each other and ourselves. We're hell-bent always to possess some new thing at any cost, and we exhaust ourselves in the pursuit of acquisitiveness and unnecessary excessiveness and excessively unnecessary acquisition. They appear to have mastered that where they realize that their freedoms are immense and enormous. They must have high responsibility at the same time. And I don't think we know that level of freedom. And to, to see it would probably be uh, give us an, a longing in our hearts for what fools we've been for so long. I think it would be good for us to see that. I think sure. That's a good Did, do you want to add anything to this? Yeah, they see the importance of manual work. You cannot always work with your head. You need some kind of compensation. And Quetzal, for instance, he built himself a blockhouse with his own hands. And um, most people are tending to their garden. They, uh, they dig with their shovels. And so they have huge plants, of course, to produce uh, fruit. But they are working uh, also with their hands. And uh, they have their work uh, duty. Everybody, the spirit guide as well, if they see some, they are traveling, they see uh, that someone needs some help and they, they get, get out there uh, and helping each other. And so uh, they, have, uh, they could have anything they wish to have, but uh, since everything is available, they don't have wishes, uh, why should they wish more than, than they could uh, digest or, or use or something like this? They are, more evolved and not hanging to the material world as we are doing. So it's, it's, it is closer to a sort of utopian society. Do they have, is there anything that they're struggling with? That, like, you know, yeah, it, they have to struggle, they have to learn, they have psych, psychological things to learn. They have, uh, there are different characters among the people. You have to cope with uh, another person you don't like as much and to, to work. Uh, 
you know, you have, they have problems, but they have no war, and they have no hate, and they have no jealousy, and these things they don't have anymore. And they live 10 times longer or so, so yeah, the consequences... More than, more than 10 times. Yeah. yeah. 11. Thank you. Thank you for, thank you for coming. Um, did the Pleiaran speak about the time 2012 and what might be coming upon our Earth at this time, like a lot of the other groups are? 2012. Mm -hmm. uh, in seven years. Do they talk about stargates opening or any other kind of phenomenon like that? Stargate, yes. You, know, you can forget stargate. That's not, not a real thing. And uh, perhaps I can give uh, another information that uh, is not liked much by perhaps m many people that uh, within the last 240 years there have only been two real ad abduction. abductions uh, the last 240 years. And uh, to my knowledge, this has been the Betty Barney Hill case and uh, the one uh, Calvin. Uh, uh, the Pascual, Pas M oh, and Pascual, was that in Mississippi? Calvin he Parker or someone. Oh, uh, Calvin Hick, Parker? Hick. Yeah. You, mu you must know this. You know every oh, case. Oh, 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 only two, two cases. Never heard. Oh, Pascagoula case. Yeah. yeah, what about the Pascagoula case? That's a real adapt. adapt, adapt that was abduction. considered a real one? Yeah, that's a real one. And so many people are, um, are um, have. Um, Made, uh, made up these, uh, these uh, happenings. Uh, they have, uh, by some, some ways, through some ways, they have uh, foreign uh, metal in their skin and so, or under their skin, and so that uh, has nothing at all to do with uh, extraterrestrials. Well, one of the things, and I'm not going to lose the thread of what you asked about 2012, but what, to elaborate on what Christian was just saying, the um, let's go to something I didn't get a chance to go into in depth. In 1997, Billy had a contact in which he was told that the UFO cover-up actually started in 1915 when the sighting of extraterrestrial objects over the World War I battlefields were at first thought to be United States craft. This is from the translation from the Gaia guys, so you could tell me if they got it wrong or not. And that uh, from uh, Wilson, Coolidge, Harding, uh, Truman, uh, Roosevelt, Truman, uh, five, six different U.S. presidents, three popes, even Joseph Stalin, all came to understand that these had to be extraterrestrial and represented a threat to the power structure. So Roosevelt apparently was instrumental in uh, bringing about the radio performance of the War of the Worlds he had, the, I guess, the Secret Services pressured H.G. Wells to adapt it for a radio presentation and Orson Wells to be the one that would narrate it so as to start a trend of creating a negative idea, a fearful image of extraterrestrials as weird life forms, dangerous, um, you know, and this would be seeded through all of our media and all of this stuff. So this is an idea. I don't know this is true or not. I'm just telling you what this information says. So in there is an agenda to make people fearful of extraterrestrials. And all of this, as well as the kind of humorous and playful images we've had in the media, has been percolating through the media for maybe 70 years. In the subconscious, in our subnoxious minds, we pick up all this stuff and we craft things to our own, you know, even unconsciously crafted uh, fears and desires and what have you, and we mix things in there. So to some degree, to whatever degree it may be, don't we understand that we are fabricating a lot of things and that the psyche is strong enough to create these things? We know that people with multiple personality disorders can manifest scars or have them disappear or all sorts of things happen. You know of people who have stigmata, who produce bleeding in their hands because of some consciousness-related uh, energy or, or disorder. So if what Christian just said, that only two genuine cases of abductions, everybody that's interested in the abduction field is going to go, no, that can't be true. But what do we really base this on? As he was saying about little items caught under the skin, Billy had written that people very often pick up things accidentally and it forms a scar around it and then the, 
uh, or spider bites and different things. So before we simply swallow the idea that everybody and their brother and sister is, is on some you know, conveyor belt into extraterrestrial craft and having uh, you know, babies born that you never can find and all this other stuff, maybe we should calm down and take more responsibility for our thoughts and investigate how we got off on this whole tangent with evil extraterrestrials and also know that in this case they say there are negative extraterrestrials and your world is going to have to defend itself at some point against them too. But don't go giving away all your power to every fantasy about bug-eyed aliens examining you, uh, you know, on the table. And perhaps for the, the end of this, I didn't say this in my lecture, um, an information that during, since 1927, there have only been eight real contacts between ETs and terrestrial human beings. That's uh, an information from the contacts. One being the Dan Free or the Fry, Fry. Fry from, from America. And so, um, yeah. Dan Fry, yeah. Dan Fry. So Billy doesn't say he's the only contactee. He says he's the only one in contact with this particular race. Mm -hmm. And, you know, everything else is a lot of uh, opinions. Have to think it through for yourself. As to the 2012 question, one thing I noticed in, in the uh, information was that that was one year in which the possibility of a third world war could take place, but there were a number of years. 2006, 2008, 10, and 12 among them. But this is up to us. Maybe we don't have to have a third world war if we really start getting that we don't have to have that. So those numbers, I know that this is probably asked in connection with the Mayan prophecies and, and the Mayan calendar, about which I know almost nothing. So I, I really can't comment on that. But in terms of the Meyer case, the only thing I've seen about 2012 was specifically about a possible year for this war to happen if we are not working this out. Yes, uh, this is for uh, Christian. Uh, how have the ages of the contacts been determined? Or the, the age? The ages. You, uh, so, uh, there's so many years old. Ah, yeah. Billy uh, is interested. They, they already know the plans, the new ones that are coming, that he will ask them about the age and uh, about the profession or something like this. And he always asks now the meaning of their names. I didn't mention them, all of these names. The meaning behind this uh, is interested to know because he's writing one of his books that he's writing is a book of names. He already has written one and he's a, uh, there will be a very large book, and so he needs this uh, information for, he, for his book. And is this uh, Earth years, or? Uh... Earth years, yeah, of, yeah, of course, yes. yes. Mm -hmm. They're very close in the actual rotation of the planet. Yeah. For a year, it's just very close. Er era is like Terra, like here, nearly, nearly. And uh, did you say that the uh, contacts have helped with editing the notes? They really are and have helped. They helped Billy with the translations and corrections. Uh, yes, uh, with these here, they are because they uh, have recorded all of the talks through their subconsciousness. They have been recorded, and so they can uh, get the information back and can um, compare it with what's written in here. And is it possible for them to also? Uh, Understand English? They are, yeah, yeah, they understand. Uh, the ones who have learned English uh, understand it, and the other pe people who don't understand have their, their uh, translation device. Because, uh, as in, in, for instance, with Asina, the, the amphibian woman, she, she cannot talk like, like us. She has a, a good role, uh, so, uh, a, a speech you, you cannot easily understand, and she had to use a, a translation device that has to do with, this, with the consciousness that uh, transforms the thoughts into language, into the, uh, in the other persons. So maybe uh, they could uh, help uh, translate uh, into English. Yeah, they don't do our work. Not we have to do our work for ourselves, and all the, the people of, uh, of uh, language, um, region has to look that they 
get their translations done by themselves. FICO Switzerland is, uh, is uh, responsible for German only. And, and there are what, uh, like another five languages currently being translated. So uh, if there were people that were willing to help with the translation and were competent or could help to fund it, then the translations can proceed in, in the language. Uh, for instance, the people in Australia, uh, Dyson Divine and Vivian Legg, are doing on their own time translation and they submit it to uh, Christian for approval to see is this you know close enough in the meaning of the contact so that we can post it as an unofficial translation and people can at least uh, have a gist of the information. Yeah, and in Japan they have uh, translated several books. There are people who are paying a uh, professional translator to translate the books and this is possible on, also in, in the English. Yeah, it's in Italian and Spanish they're working, and I think, is it Russian or Polish or something also? There's a the Russia is the Talmud Emanuel is also the only one yeah. in Russian. This will be for Wendell. Uh, do you believe that the current Pope Benedict is one of the five conspirators? No, I, I don't believe that. I think that... Uh, the co-conspirators, one of them died now, there's three left, that the co-conspirators in the Vatican chose an older man this time because they still are controlling the Vatican hierarchy and it gives them some moving space. Uh, they could have chosen one of their own, which was suggested at one time, and then, and, and then we, the third prophecy would certainly be fulfilled. We would have a serial murderer sitting in the, in the chair of the Pope. But I think that they chose an older man to just to buy time. And <laughs> by the way, I, I just want to bring something up. Uh, Wendell didn't in his speech, but Wendell is someone who saw uh, 11 rather remarkable photographs of San Francisco. And I just want to ask Wendell to tell you about this, if you would. Okay, Billy was taken on a trip in time, and, and Semyasi asked him what he would like to see. And he said, I would like to see San Francisco and the next big earthquake that's been forecast or predicted for it. So she took him someplace in time and showed him San Francisco undergoing a major earthquake where it was shaking buildings down. And in the, he, he, and she allowed him to take pictures on the viewing screens with his camera. And there was one picture of the Transamerica Tower uh, breaking about two thirds of the way up from the upper right hand side as you looked at it from, I think from the east, down to the lower half left hand side at about a 30 degree angle and it was beginning to slide off. And there was plumes of fire and plumes of smoke and plumes of of water from the broken lines and pipes and everything in the photograph. Now, as soon as the photograph, the uh, first problem came is when Billy came home with the pictures. Lee and I and Tom and Britt were sitting around the kitchen table and he opened the envelope and looked at them and passed them around. And, and we all looked at the pictures. And there wasn't just one picture, there were 11 pictures in the envelope. The 11 pictures showed different scenes of San Francisco going down. And after that, uh, just a few days after that, Semyasi picked Meyer up again and, and said she wanted to have to take the pictures to look at the negatives. And, and when she refused to give them back, she said, you showed the pictures against our instructions to others that can affect the lives of a lot of, a lot of people and we, we're not going to return the pictures to you. So he never got them back. All, all that was ever saw was the 11 that, that we looked at. And the one picture that, that had the Transamerica Tower in it matched a painting that was done for GEO magazine by a staff artist fairly closely, but not really exact. The, the buildings were the same, but uh, the, uh, the plumes of smoke and fire and gas were not in the painting. A, a few of them were, but not like in the picture that we saw. And other buildings were, had, were collapsing. There was a rectangular building with towers on both ends, and the towers were falling in, smashing the middle, and things like that. There was also, we were looking for cars in the streets to try to gauge some time for this to happen. 
and the cars that we couldn't recognize on the street, and there weren't too many on the street, by the way, <coughs> the streets were not completely closed as in the GEO painting. The GEO painting showed the streets impassable for emergency vehicles. In Billy's pictures, they, they, they were not impassable. They could have been cleared with the bulldozer or something like that. But we were looking for a time somehow, and so there were a number of cars shown in the pictures. And the car that we had never seen was the, a car that looked more like a Volkswagen than anything else, a smooth contoured car. It has tiny fins beginning to be drawn up on the rear fenders. And it had glass, the windshield got glass came clear back to the back of the front door. So that the, the door, the front door in the car opened in a glass frame. And we haven't seen anything like that yet, but we do see the skylights getting bigger and bigger and going further back. So it's not going to happen tomorrow, but it may happen in the next 10 or 15 years. And uh, those other 11 pictures were, they were quite graphic. They, they showed some scenes that overlapped so we could see that uh, in, as we looked at the pictures that they, they were, we were all related. And it was, it was very impressive to see. It looked like a lot of destruction, but they told Billy at the same time that this could be avoided by mass mind uh, con concentration. People that gave up uh, harmful ideas and wars and things like that that add energy, negative energy to the, to the situation. Could, enough of that could have, could have stalled this all off. It one didn't have to happen. Anybody else have a question? We've got a couple minutes remaining. What's, what's the nature of the contact today? Use your microphone. Or I'll repeat that since it's short. What's the nature of the contacts today? You know more about this. Yeah. They're still going on with Billy now. Yeah, now uh, 21st uh, January was the 410th. And now uh, at his burst in February 3, uh, he certainly had uh, contact also. And so we are about 412. And they will continue as long as he lives. Face to face, yes, mm -hmm. and telepathic also, yes. Mm -hmm. They come in his bureau, his office, or he goes up or outside sometimes in, 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 the, in the surroundings. I, I think I'll tell a quick couple of things in a minute. Billy, uh, when I visited last year, we were talking about some things, and he said uh, when Pata had brought uh, some of the younger women and people to, who are only 130 years old or whatever, and he said the two of the women, I think it was, wanted to go and look at the birds that are in the enclosure, and they and he said, well, be careful, no one sees you, and they said, well, we are, we'll screen ourselves off, and they disappeared, and so Billy said to me, he said, you know, I never get used to that as many times as I've seen it, someone just disappearing in front of me, but here's the one that I really love. In 2004, when I was there, a year before last, I was with Billy, and I happened to see he had his computer there, and I looked over, and the printer had all these sheets of paper, and he said, oh yeah, I write the teachings for the play iron people, and Quetzal comes, and he picks it up, and he takes it back, but this is very foolish and time-consuming. So he said, next week, Zafana Panea comes to fix my computer so that it will now write it, it will go to a separate server, and it will go to a separate little disk above the earth, and then it will send back to the play iron. So last year, I went there, and I thought, I've got to see if I can trip Billy up, because as much as I know this is real, you have to keep, you know, there's a responsibility. So here it was. I said, Billy, last year, you said Zafanat Panaic is coming. And he said to me, oh, yeah, I write the teachings for the play, and I always have them over here, and then Quetzal has to come and pick them up. But Zafanat Panea came. He fixed the computer, so now when I write it for the play, and it goes to a separate server, goes to a little disk, and it sends it to the play, and but... He has to come back. I said, why? He says, he screwed something up in my computer when we fixed that. So you have an IT from outer space, and there it is. Good. Time's up. Thank you. Uh, these, uh, these books that Christian brought from Switzerland are the continuations after the, the first 100 contacts. He's agreed to leave them on my table back there in the pack, back for anybody that wants to see them. They cost $50 in Switzerland. And if anybody wants to buy any of them for that, we don't have, can't discount them. I think Christian had to pay for them to bring them here. But they are a bit. $40. $40. I'm sorry, $40.
$40 for anybody that's interested. But you can look through them, look at the contacts. It's in, in German, but there's a lot of pictures and corroborative information filed with the, the case in each, in each event. Wendell, Michael, Christian, thank you. See everybody at 8.30 in the morning. Good night.